Good afternoon and welcome to the 10th installment of the Alliance's COVID-19 webinar series focusing on people who are unsheltered. I'm Mindy Mitchell, a Senior Technical Assistance Specialist here at the National Alliance to End Homelessness. And joining us today for this important webinar are Michael Durham, Technical Assistance Manager from the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. Kendall Cloder, Housing Program Manager in the Home Homeless and Special Needs Housing Unit at the Division of Housing of the State of Virginia Department of Housing and Community Development. That's a long one, Kendall. Rachel Biggs, Policy Director at Albuquerque Healthcare for the Homeless, and Marco Santana, Director of Engagement at LA Family Housing. Um, before we get started, I have just a few housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded and all registrants for the webinar will receive an email with an accompanying link to the recording, the slides, and additional resources within 24 hours of this broadcast. All attendees are muted and will remain so throughout the broadcast and all video functions have been turned off. The Zoom chat function is disabled, but if you have questions, please enter them into the Zoom Q&A box, which should be at the bottom of your screen. Questions will be held until after all presentations are complete and then there will be time for Q&A in which all panelists will participate. Any questions that we don't get to will be gathered by Alliance staff and will be included on the Ending Homelessness Forum, which I'll talk about some more in just a minute. Um, the Alliance will continue the COVID-19 webinar series throughout the month of May, and you can access resources and sign up for future webinars on the Alliance's webinar series page. If you haven't already, please do sign up for the Ending Homelessness Forum. It's a place for communities to obtain information on federal funding and guidance on the COVID-19 homeless response. You can also share information about the successes and emerging promising practices, as well as ask questions for each other on how to confront common challenges that communities and programs are facing. Finally, we have a really big announcement the Alliance and the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council are developing and launching seven courses to support staff working with people experiencing homelessness in hotel and motel settings and in congregate settings. These courses are meant to assist in onboarding staff and new hires in the COVID-19 response. Healthcare professionals working with people experiencing homelessness for the first time and shelter staff will also benefit from these courses. Through a generous grant from the Kaiser Permanente National Community Benefit Fund at the East Bay Community Foundation, the Alliance and National Healthcare for the Homeless Council will offer these courses for free for up to 2,500 users. Please visit our website early next week to enroll. Now, to start today's webinar, we have Michael Durham, Technical Assistance Manager from the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. Thank you, Mindy. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, but I wanted to start uh, by acknowledging the intensity of the moment. For many of us, this is our eighth week in quarantine. Um, and I know for me, uh, the, the melancholy has really started to, to set in and um, the, the social distancing is really beginning to take a, a toll. And I know that uh, many of you don't have the privilege of self social distancing because you're out on the front line. Um, so I just wanted to begin by just thanking you all for the really hard work that you're doing um, and acknowledging that this is uh, potentially traumatic. Um, and we really have to focus uh, on taking care of ourselves as we do this work. Um, so um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a, a, a national perspective, and this is really from our vantage point at the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council, and I'll be curious to see uh, how it resonates with uh, the work that you're doing in your communities. Um, but, uh, but first, let me show off our fancy new, if verbose, mission statement uh, here at the National Council. Uh, grounded in human rights and social justice, the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council mission is to build an equitable, high-quality healthcare system through training, research, and advocacy in the movement on homelessness. Uh, and so really, you can think of us as the healthcare arm and the national body of organizations uh, 
that comprise the movement on homelessness. Uh, and if you've never heard of us before, I know mo many of you are shelters, COC providers of different types, housing providers uh, may not have heard of us. I encourage you to get more involved. We are also doing a bi-weekly webinar series um, and a million other things. So please look us up on our website. Next slide, please. So just a few notes about what we're seeing uh, in the field before we get into the, a state level perspective and then two local perspectives. Um, if you've ever been to one of our conferences, we hand out bumper stickers that say housing is healthcare uh, and another that says healthcare is a human right. And that has never been uh, clearer to us as we see this uh, public health crisis illuminate um, the gaps in services uh, for people living homeless. Um, and so just as people are scrambling to prioritize housing, we're just conscious that this is what we should have been doing all along, uh, that the health disparities were already there, that homelessness was already a national tragedy uh, and worth prioritizing. So it's a little too late, but uh, we're glad that um, the concept that housing is healthcare is now commonplace, especially in the media and, and, and conversations everywhere. Um, we have seen many communities and uh, states uh, put moratoria on sweeps of encampments uh, for now, um, but I'm conscious that many communities are, are not doing that at all. I was on a call uh, yesterday that Salt Lake City, for example, was still cracking down on sweeps, still giving citations to folks living, sleeping outside. Um, so there's just a, a wide range of approaches right now, uh, and as we'll talk about uh, from national guidance in, in a little bit, um, Really, we need to stop with the sweeps. <laughs> it's not helping anybody. Um, just from the perspective of clients, we, we know that um, folks uh, who are experiencing homelessness so often rely on libraries, day shelters, um, other public spaces during the day that uh, are now being closed, have been closed for quite some time now. Um, and so that's really been, a, uh, that's disrupted their lives. It's disrupted the services they normally access. Um, and it's become a real problem. Um, and then we've seen shelters close, uh, nighttime shelters as well. Um, and th so that, of course, is gonna lead to an increase in the unsheltered population. Um, moreover, uh, folks who may ordinarily be sleeping in shelters, even if they are remaining open, um, may be choosing to sleep outside. And I hope we get into this a little bit later, uh, just about, uh, you know, the, conf the, the conflicting uh, focus here, um, we know that so many folks are trying to get folks who are living outside into shelters, but in some, you know, congregate settings, um, congregate shelters may not necessarily be safer. Um, and so I've definitely heard stories of folks choosing to sleep outside instead who may have ordinarily been sleeping inside. Um, next slide, please. So this is just, you know, some anecdotal evidence here that we've seen some housing placements really focusing on getting folks from the shelters into housing um, and less emphasis being placed on people who have been sleeping outside or in encampments. Um, and, you know, we primarily focus or represent uh, community health centers and specifically the healthcare for the homeless health centers um, across the country. And especially in the early days when uh, March, early April, um, we saw that folks were beginning to reduce their rounds uh, and their outreach services to the bare minimum, really just checking in on folks, but not really offering uh, the, the comprehensive level of care that they may ordinarily be doing. Um, but many others are increasing their outreach, and I'm excited to hear from Albuquerque in particular to hear how they've taken a different approach. Um, and so, yeah, as I put on the slide here, in lieu of adequate shelter resources and or political will, some communities are organizing camps and parking lots, open lots, et cetera. Um, I, I think it was, at least on my Twitter feed, uh, it was getting a lot of attention uh, when Vegas, uh, when Las Vegas just drew, painted lines on a parking lot, um, when of course that is a tourist destination that has a, a whole bunch of empty hotels. Um, and I, I know that that's not unique to Vegas. I'm not trying to single them out. Um, and it's hard, right? Because there are so few options when there may not be the leadership to provide uh, hotels um, or housing for folks. And that's maybe the only thing that we can do is dedicate an open lot that a, a local church has, for example. Um, but of course, that's insufficient. Um, and then another theme, finally, that I've heard from the field 
uh, is that when the when all these other services that normally serve folks who stay outside uh, are being shut down, it's even more difficult than it ordinarily is to take uh, to keep in touch with clients, um, and that has become a real struggle. And I'd be very curious today to see if folks have um, found ways to overcome that. So um, my last slide here before I turn it over to the panelists, um, or actually two more slides, but this one, uh, I just want to highlight some of the work that uh, has been developed across the country. Um, in my limited experience working with COCs, the term street medicine may not be familiar. Of course, it's, it, you can intuit what it means, um, it's, but it's providing medical care outside and really street medicine professionals will tell you that they can do almost everything on the street that they could in a clinic. Um, and so I would love to promote the work of our friends at the Street Medicine Institute and particularly the, the guidelines they put out um, pretty early on in this crisis. Um, and I've got links there to a couple other national resources. And then on our webpage, we've got, gosh, a growing list of things that keeps on getting longer. Um, but I've put here a few uh, sample guidelines uh, from local communities um, that I hope you'll look into. And then lastly, um, a group of national partners, of course, led by the National Alliance to End Homelessness has developed this framework. And I hope that everybody has seen their emails or otherwise heard about this. Uh, but if this is the first time you're hearing about it, let me just read to you a little bit about uh, its intention. So it provides guidance for how homelessness systems can leverage the CARES Act and approval of other funding sources, such as FEMA public assistance to simultaneously conduct emergency protective measures while planning for recovery-oriented uses of these funds. The purpose of the framework is to provide guidance on how communities can use these funds strategically across a range of key public health and economic recovery strategies to help communities meet public health goals, to increase housing stability, to prevent future increases in homelessness that result from an economic downturn. Um, and all of these components, it says very eloquently in the uh, introductory paragraph, must utilize a, a racial equity lens. Um, and of course, these actions will need to be coordinated across many partners and systems across all levels of government, including emergency management offices and emergency operations, cash assistance programs, public health, physical health, and behavioral health care, homelessness services and housing, food and nutrition, and others. Um, and, you know, they really want me to emphasize that this will be uh, adapted as necessary, uh, that we will continue to update this document um, as new information comes forward. We all know that the guidance is changing rapidly. Um, and as we continue to learn more and the crisis unfolds, we will continue to update this document. Um, but for today's webinar, we really are focusing on unsheltered people. The slide focuses the recommendations and this uh, overview uh, image here uh, on unsheltered folks. Uh, and then the, the framework is broken into four sort of buckets, immediate actions, short-term actions, medium-term actions, and longer-term actions. Um, so this is on the website, um, and I hope that everybody accesses it um, and uses this as a framework. Um, so we're going to kind of turn to a state level, level view now uh, of how this is, uh, of how communities are focusing on unsheltered folks. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn the mic over to Kendall. Thank you. So my name is Kendall Clater, and I am the housing program manager for the state of Virginia's Department of Housing and Development. And uh, Mindy, go ahead and go to the next slide there. So DHCD is committed to creating safe and affordable and prosperous communities to live, work, and do business in Virginia. And next slide. And our unit is the Homeless and Special Needs Housing Unit and within DHCD. And we work to ensure homelessness is rare, brief, and non-recurring. And to that end, we administer a continuum of state and federally funded homeless services programs to address housing and stabilization services for individuals and families at risk of or experiencing homelessness in the Commonwealth. And our most comprehensive grant program that we do this with is through our Virginia Homeless Solutions Program, which is an application-based grant that provides funding to each COC and balances state local planning group to support their community's emergency crisis response system. Next slide. Uh, and before I really dig into our state's COVID-19 homelessness response stuff, I wanted to let everyone know that I've 
I think along with everyone else lost track of time. So I am going to be using the executive orders issued by governors, uh, sorry, Virginia's Governor Northam to establish our timelines throughout this presentation and hopefully just give you all a little bit of reference for the length of time that we've been doing this, which is not long at all, but um, also feels like forever. So next slide, please. So it was on March 23rd that Governor Northam issued the statewide closure of all non-essential businesses. And around this time, we began working with our COCs and local planning groups to figure out uh, ways to adjust our normal grant guidelines to meet the needs of our congregate and emergency shelter providers. We allowed grantees to move funds from other categories into their emergency shelter operations in order to purchase enough cleaning supplies or reconfigure their shelter space to adopt um, social distancing requirements and provide hazard pay to their frontline staff among some, among some other changes. And then on March 30th, Governor Northam announced the state home order for Virginia. And it was around this time that we really began to readjust our thinking from thinking about how we should improve our current operations to what we needed to do to protect the most vulnerable individuals in our communities. And it goes without saying that individuals experiencing homelessness are likely to be disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. And based on what we know in the realm of homeless services, we can then presume that individuals experiencing unsheltered homelessness are particularly vulnerable. And we know it's because persons experiencing unsheltered homelessness have a high rate of chronic health conditions that often go untreated. And so with this understanding, Virginia set our primary focus, uh, and that was to help people secure emergency shelter for persons who are unsheltered, as well as uh, guests of shelters that require them to leave during the day. And we added this additional focus at the end there because we wanted to ensure everyone has access, access to 24-7 shelter in order to reduce the risk of spreading COVID-19. And with folks and, uh, and households exiting shelter during the day, they were more at risk of exposure to COVID-19 and potential, could potentially bring this back to the congregate shelter uh, setting. Next slide, please. So on April 3rd, Governor Northam announced an initial allocation of two and a half million dollars in emergency funding to provide shelter for approximately 1,500 Virginians who are currently unsheltered and guests of shelter that require them to leave in the day. And that's one thing that really hit me while preparing for this webinar and um, trying to recreate this timeline. And uh, next slide, please. It uh, really felt like ages between the time that our team began to focus our efforts on helping those experiencing unsheltered homelessness access shelter to the time that this emergency funding was announced. And um, it was actually just a little over a week. And that's just an incredibly short amount of time to take to make these important policy decisions that will impact first so many individuals, right, but also our communities and service providers and also be as responsible and effective as possible with this public funding. But um, almost as soon as our team identified this need to get folks off the street and into shelter, our agency leadership as well as Governor Northam rallied behind this cause and we knew it then but looking back at it back it's even more apparent that we've been incredibly fortunate to have such strong support from our leaders, um, but it was also confirmation that this priority was the right one. Next slide, please. So in order to get the necessary funding out to our communities as quickly as possible, we used the 2020 preliminary point in time count data as well as information from our CFCs and local planning groups to identify how many individuals would meet our priority focus. And then we then allocated what we called an initial wave or wave one funding to each COC and local planning group based on their unsheltered count and the number of guests of shelters that closed during the day. Eligible activities for this initial wave are, are listed here, but they're all centered around ensuring access to 24 seven shelter. Uh, so things like case management and supportive services, but also the cost to connect persons experiencing unsheltered homelessness with shelter, including transportation to shelter from an unsheltered uh, position. And then also hotel or motel vouchers, so that non-congregate sheltering piece, uh, supplies and food for individuals, and then also costs to secure additional congregate shelters if needed for the community. Next slide, please. 
So I wanted to provide everyone with some results and, you know, really, we don't have any formal or statewide results uh, so far for our efforts. And so I can't tell you if it's worked or if it's not worked, but we are continually receiving updates from many of our COCs and local planning groups. And of note, uh, one COC has stated that, this, that with this wave one of funding and by coordinating with their street outreach, that they've been able to functionally end unsheltered homelessness in their community. And another community has also let us know that they've been able to engage individuals in shelter and supportive services who had previously been resistant to assistance. So, so you know, anecdotally, we've seen a lot of success in this uh, priority focus and, and providing that non-congregate sheltering to unsheltered individuals. But um, again, we don't have full results yet, but hopefully uh, soon enough we'll all be able to kind of pause and, and collect that data. So next slide, please. So next steps, we are now preparing for our next wave of funding that is mostly coming from our state's allocation of CARES Act ESG funding. And, um, you know, I'm not sure if this is really something that I should even say, but we, you know, we have never possibly, will we ever again have this much funding for homeless services in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And, and I, I assume that's probably similar to a lot of other states, but particularly this amount of funding that we can target to our most vulnerable and our hardest to serve populations. Uh, we have an opportunity here to have a real impact on homelessness in Virginia. And if we do this right and continue to do this correctly, we will have dedicated resources to serve the hardest to serve and not only connect these individuals with shelter, but also as part of our next wave of funding, we'll begin to focus on moving these individuals and households into permanent housing. So keeping in mind that this is on top of our normal funding sources that exist to support a community's crisis response system, um, which includes things from outreach to prevention and wrapper housing, for wave two funding, part of our focus will remain on continuing that emergency sheltering piece with the um, non-congregate setting mostly for individuals who have been newly engaged in shelter as a result of COVID-19. But we'll be advancing this to now working to help folks move from shelter to permanent housing and secure stable housing with sufficient financial assistance and supportive services. So this is obviously a much longer term effort and a, and a big lift for our communities and providers as well. But through their existing crisis response systems and with the help of this additional funding to increase staff capacity, uh, provide that financial assistance made available uh, to clients. We really do believe that each COC and local planning group in Virginia has the ability to dramatically impact homelessness in their community. And I would, I would like to go even further and say that we could functionally end homelessness in Virginia with this funding, but I don't want to scare people um, if they're listening from Virginia. But um, so that's, that's all that I had for just kind of how we made this decision, you know, Focusing on unsheltered homelessness for us was was pretty an, an easier decision to make, but I think overall by the quick response that we had from our leaders, it just confirmed that it was the right one. And from our from our communities, everyone has just really jumped off with with this whole priority. So we've seen some so far again and anecdotally some good results, and it's um, positioned us for some positive changes as we continue to implement this new funding. So uh, that is it for Virginia. Thank you, Kendall. Um, I really appreciate hearing how you guys have uh, utilized new funding and I, and I share your hope that we can um, take advantage of this uh, to make more um, systemic solutions uh, or achievements um, because it's not gonna be a new normal and we don't, uh, we don't wanna go back to normal because uh, normal was tragic. So I appreciate your perspective. Um, we're going to turn now to a city level view and really the, the vantage point of a healthcare for the homeless program and one of our uh, favorite members in Albuquerque. So with that, I'll turn it over to Rachel. Great. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. I'm really excited to be able to share a little bit about the amazing work that our street outreach teams are, are doing during the time of COVID right now. Um, I'll start with just a high level overview of who we are. Albuquerque Healthcare for the Homeless was one of the original 19 cities that was chosen to participate in a pilot demonstration project in 1985. And we've been operating ever since. We started in an Airstream trailer, and now we are um, taking our services both to the field and at our central campus. 
our vision is to live in a world that is just and without homelessness. And we are, as Michael said, a freestanding federally qualified health center and a standalone 330H project. And what that means is we're part of the community health center funding, but we just serve exclusively the population of people without homes. At Healthcare for the Homeless in Albuquerque, we do provide integrated primary care, which includes dental, behavioral health, and social services. And we do this mostly through extensive outreach, both um, on our campus and uh, throughout the community. Next slide. So today from 1985 to present, we've grown to over 100 staff. We serve about 7,000 people a year without homes here in Albuquerque. Our population is um, pretty much exclusively people 100% uh, below the federal poverty line. It's important to note that in 2014, New Mexico expanded Medicaid. So traditionally our clients were about 85 to 95% uninsured and with Medicaid expansion, that's really flipped. Um, we estimate that about 80% of our, our population is eligible for Medicaid and we work really hard to do a lot of outreach and enrollment work to make sure people have access to Medicaid and coverage. Next slide. So to dive into how we view street medicine at Albuquerque Healthcare for the Homeless, it's really um, a hallmark of our delivery system. It's how we get our integrated healthcare services out to the field. And it has the purpose of first engaging people and breaking down barriers, creating relationships, um, bringing services to them, and then sometimes linking them back to our site-based services, but they don't have to be exclusive of each other. So sometimes we'll, we'll be taking care out to the field and we'll never see people back at our campus and other times we'll be engaging folks and hopefully engaging them into care on our central campus. We do rely on the, the Street Medicine Institute for a lot of great information. I did put their definition up here as we talk about what street medicine means. Um, you can see their, their definition here and I encourage those to go to streetmedicine.org. Um, they have some great resources that we've been relying on. Our medical director also came to us from California and was really skilled in street medicine and the provision of street medicine services. And that's really been a way to kind of re-engage back to our roots, our, our street medicine culture and core. All right, so moving on, with the COVID-19 um, response, health, healthcare for the homeless was really well positioned to be pretty nimble and respond pretty quickly to um, the COVID-19 pandemic. So starting about March 15th, we started to shift our resources, really deploying and redeploying our staff in very thoughtful ways that was both real-time strategic and continuous, and it continues to be nimble in a very quickly changing environment. As we all know, things move quickly, um, and it's been quite amazing to see how our teams, um, over 100 people on staff, were able to rise to the challenge and really redeploy in ways to meet the needs of our, our population. So we started pretty early on COVID specific street medicine being available to um, respond as needed and also have scheduled street medicine times to go out and find people um, really emphasizing on engagement, meeting people where they are both literally and figuratively, providing a lot of great COVID-19 education um, for people that are living in encampments. And then we've also deployed to um, help set up the isolation hotels and uh, the shelters that are being used for isolation and quarantine spaces right now in our community. And we are providing medical care, integrated care. Our teams are going out and doing rounding at those sites to make sure people have access to primary care, behavioral health, case management, um, harm reduction services. Um, and the last thing that's been exciting too, while we're not set up as a testing site as it will at Healthcare for the Homeless at our main campus, we do um, have access to COVID-19 testing and we are able to take that testing out to the field. So when um, people are out on outreach, our community partners are out in the community and they identify someone that we might need to go out and screen, we can do the screening and then if, if necessary, we can do testing um, right there on the street and help assist people through the different pathways into care from there. Next slide. So this, this is just one segment of the response system that we're a part of. Um, it's part of a larger response system, but just looking at the street medicine response that we have been um, thankful, really helpful to 
been a part of kind of shaping that conversation and what street medicine looks like during COVID. Um, so you'll see that we, we have taken the lead on being kind of the street medicine dispatch. We're working with a really coordinated group with our city of Albuquerque, our shelter system, our emergency departments, our other um, homeless service providers to be that central intake point so people can call our street medicine line um, and coordinate care with us for people that are living on the street. And so how that works is that um, that phone number is used to dispatch and we'll either send out one of our street medicine teams and we work really closely with First Nations, which is another federally qualified health center that does have a healthcare for the homeless grant. And they also have a great street medicine team. So depending on the needs of the client, um, if they have relationships with our clinicians or with First Nations, we're able to dispatch the correct teams. They'll go and meet people um, on the street, assess, decide what the next best um, avenue for care is. And what I wanted to highlight here was that we've really been able to emphasize the importance of, um, first of all, following CDC guidance and making sure that encampments aren't moved and that people are able to safely isolate in place if they need to, um, and provide a lot of different options for people. And I think this is where we've been really successful working with um, a great collaboration and coordinated response with all of these partners that I've listed to be able to provide um, people living on the street with an option of isolating in their encampment, perhaps going to an isolation hotel if they need testing, um, or going to one of our shelters that have been set up with isolation spaces. And I think this has been a great way to be able to, one, get the services out to people that need them, and to um, decrease the barrier so people don't feel um, scared to access testing and feel like they're gonna be taken to an isolation space where they'll have no choice in, in how they live for the next two weeks. So we've been really fortunate to be able to have that working relationship with our city. So this type of mobilization that we've been doing as street medicine has increased as we've noticed people um, are less actively seeking shelter um, and looking to isolate in their encampments. And we're also seeing a decrease in the number of people on our campus. So we, we really wanted to use that opportunity to pivot our resources and make sure we're taking our care out to the streets where people need it most. All right, moving on to the next slide. We have been looking at our, our COVID-19 response in kind of three phases, the pre-event, the event, and the post-event um, in the emergency management world. And in the phase one response, we were pretty central in helping set up isolation and quarantine areas, um, mostly within the shelter system, really focusing on de-intensifying shelters, a lot of preventative work to move vulnerable, high-risk individuals from the large congregate settings to smaller shelter settings, um, and at this time, we really started to shift the percent of time that our staff was spending on outreach. So our, just our medical providers alone, they went from about 10% of their time on outreach to about 40% of their time on outreach, both in the field and at these new isolation um, areas. Then in phase two, kind of where we are right now, we really are focusing on supporting individuals both in the time of COVID and preventing kind of further worsening of chronic health conditions so that we are trying to anticipate um, an influx in the number of people seeking services kind of post event. Um, we know that people are delaying care right now. People are scared. They're worried to go to ERs. They don't want to end up um, in congregant settings. So there, a lot of people are, are staying either sheltered in place in their encampments or in other areas throughout our city. And it's really been our job to go out and, and find people and take care to them. We're focusing on really preventing further morbidity in other areas of health. So we're ensuring access to medications for chronic disease management. Um, we are focusing on supporting individuals with substance use disorder, with medication assisted treatment, and really leaning on our harm reduction principles right now. And then as phase three comes, you know, we're really trying to do a lot of the work right now to prevent um, an influx of many, many people seeking care on campus that might be in a sicker state than they were last time we saw them. But we are also preparing to be able to shift our resources back to campus in this case. And I will add in our, in our phase three response, new normal, you know, everything we've been really focusing on is that connection to housing. And um, as we all know, that's obviously the most important preventative action we can take right now. And a lot of our policy and advocacy has been about how can we use this as an opportunity to um, connect people to housing as quickly 
and effectively as possible. All right, moving on, wanted to touch on the work that our harm reduction team is doing um, during COVID-19. We have seen an increased need for our harm reduction services. For example, on a typical Friday night outreach where our teams are out um, in the east part of our, our city providing syringe exchange services and harm reduction, a lot of Narcan um, testing and counseling. Um, we went from seeing about 100 people to about 200 people every Friday night. So we've really seen the need for those services grow. We're fortunate that to really integrate our harm reduction outreach and we have a medical provider ID that is um, on those Friday night outreaches and seeing people as well. So we're connecting people to both that ongoing chronic care management and also addressing COVID concerns. Our harm reduction team has also played a leadership role in coordinating the street outreach response system with the city of Albuquerque. And we're really helping to target resources and make sure we're dispatching people to the right, the right um, places within the system. Great. Next slide. Some of the examples that we've been um, sharing of our outreach education, this was really uh, a lot of information was taken from the Street Medicine Institute, the San Francisco Department of Public Health put out some great guidance material, so we were able to use those and adjust them for our purposes here in Albuquerque. Um, and part of this system and working with other street outreach workers has really been to help one, um, provide education to outreach workers on um, healthcare, um, prevention, universal, universal precautions, and um, PPE, all of the, the things that we've been worried about. We're, we're helping to support others doing this work and making sure that um, widely our partners are connected into the system of care for COVID so that when they're out on the street, they know the number, that street medicine number to call to connect folks um, into the system and make sure that we are getting care to them as quickly as possible. All right. And I'll just end with, we've, we've really seen um, healthcare for the homeless is be able to kind of rise to the occasion right now. It's been really exciting to see the role that Albuquerque Healthcare for the Homeless has been playing in our city's coordinated response to people without homes, both within the shelter system and for people living um, in unsheltered homelessness situations. So we've, we've had this role of really providing a lot of training and support for our homeless service provider partners in shelters um, and day shelters, making sure that they have kind of the, the healthcare for the homeless lens, um, understanding uh, how we can support them in questions around PPE and universal precautions. We're, we're lucky to have a dental director that had just joined us that has a master's of public health background and has really taken the lead as we've decreased some dental care services on site. She's been able to go out and provide a lot of great education and training for our partners and helping them navigate the system. We've really been relied on as a resource. We, we keep maybe um, pushing too much, but we want people to know that we're here for them. Um, our partners are able to call us with questions all the time, um, and we're, we're there to make sure that our partners get tucked into the system in really effective ways so that people aren't falling through the cracks. And through the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council, we really have the advantage of having kind of peer-to-peer -peer learning. We're able to continuously link into this wonderful practice community that provides a lot of great best practices that I have really been relying on. And I reach out to our partners on a daily basis to make sure that you know, we're, we're learning from each other and providing that, that best practice. And I look forward to having a, a good discussion and hearing your questions about all the work that we've been doing um, here locally with Albuquerque Healthcare for the Homeless with our street outreach response. And um, I encourage anyone to reach out to us uh, as I've been reaching out to our partners to lean on us for support and to develop best practices moving forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, I'm really heartened to see how uh, you've both taken the lead and collaborated uh, with local partners and the uh, other health center in your city um, serving folks who are homeless. Um, that's a really great example. Um, so one more local perspective but before we get into the full group um, Q&A. Uh, I'm excited to hear from Los Angeles uh, and specifically LA Family Housing and Marco. So I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Um, so I'll be speaking on what our teams in Los Angeles, uh, specifically, of course, LA Family Housing, um, are doing and doing in conjunction with local governments to with local government support 
um, and just how we've been successful in creating safe spaces during this pandemic, um, ultimately culminating to transitions into our non-congregate shelter settings that we've been able to, um, to get across. So we broke it down by uh, four SMART goals, if you would, during the pandemic. Um, the first one was education and prevention, uh, access to testing, um, access to shelter options, which comes in various forms, and then permanent housing prior, prioritization, because obviously our goal is to get folks permanently housed um, post COVID-19. Um, so education and prevention, the goal for this was pretty simple. Um, we wanted to provide as much knowledge about what COVID is, what are symptoms to look out for amongst your community, um, whether it's an encampment or, you know, whatever the space might be, um, and basic education on COVID-19, as well as social distancing practices and what to do if you believe you are showing symptoms. Um, in LA County, we're very, uh, we've been very, uh, there's a system 211 um, where folks just call in. Typically, it serves as an information line for folks, folks experiencing homelessness. Um, they've also doubled up to provide services if you believe you are showing symptoms as far as what uh, clinic you can go to, hospital in your area, um, and things like that. Um, so with the support of LA County, we've been able to focus on hygiene as well. Um, and through that, we were able to set up hand wash stations in some of our larger encampment settings to promote hygiene, but also to curb the spread of, of potential COVID-19. Um, we made an emphasis to regularly provide non-perishable snacks, waters, and have also begun providing meal deliveries, which was something that the rest of LA County adopted shortly thereafter. Uh, and then also uh, just on this slide, the last thing is we partnered with some of our existing partner agencies, um, such as the YMCA, which, you know, just to highlight is a nationwide entity who is focusing on providing basic items such as a shower to our unsheltered folks during this time. Um, so I know it's being done across LA County and I'm, I'm positive that, you know, this is a nationwide model that they're hoping to implement as you folks are, are trying to find what resources there are. Access to testing. Um, so this was going to be a critical effort and thankfully we were met with support and aided by our partners. Um, throughout this in the city of LA, we started what we're calling life safety teams. This is a full interdisciplinary and interagency endeavor where we partnered with our county agencies and specifically our street-based medicine teams with the intent of increasing field-based testing for COVID-19. Our outreach teams worked to identify hotspots and we actually were able to, uh, through LA County, they were able to create an app um, where they can highlight areas that they're gonna be going more regularly and, and focusing our street-based medicine teams to go and to provide um, COVID-19 tests. Um, and these are, focused, these are focused on folks that are either showing symptoms or again, it's just a larger encampment and we're wanting to get ahead of a potential spread. Uh, just to throw out a quick fact, as of last Friday, this is uh, the efforts had ac accumulated to a total of 3,000 wellness checks, a delivery of 4,000 meals, and more than 1,000 COVID-19 field tests. Next slide. Um, access Access to shelter options. To speak on some of the quick actions our city and county took, which were tremendous for us during this time, uh, LA County specifically operates a winter shelter program um, that was set to end at the end of March. First thing that occurred is the county of LA decided to extend that winter shelter program and extended it essentially throughout the rest of 2020, providing much needed access to safe haven um, for our unsheltered folks. And in additionally, in an effort to promote safer at home ordinances, the city of LA decided to close all of its parks and recreation centers, turning them later on into socially distanced emergency shelters. Um, they were able to also reposition city staff to operate these facilities with the help of service providers. So if you think of your, your normal uh, park setting, you know, access to a gym, they were able to distance out uh, beds and cots so that folks had access to that um, throughout these conditions and also just more specifically so that they were more able to isolate. These sites, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this a little later, um, but these sites again are fully staffed with uh, city staff, with service providers, and we also have uh, registered nurses on site that are checking folks' temperatures, doing regular wellness checks and so on. Um, for our neighbors not immediately accessing shelter sites, whether it's due to inavailability or other factors, we also wanted to emphasize um, the ability to self-isolate amongst your community and amongst your encampment. So things that were done were the, uh, we practiced providing tents for folks who potentially were symptomatic or were more at risk in an effort to have them more, uh, more socially isolate. Next slide. 
Um, so some additional access to shelter options is one of the very other one of the other very first things that we're able to do in and LA Family Housing is one of the providers for this is through our County Department of Public Health as well as uh, Department of Health Services. We would we were able to set up uh, IQ sites or isolation and quarantine sites. These are sites that have been set up specifically to isolate and quarantine unsheltered folks that either have tested positive. Um, are symptomatic and are awaiting results or have potentially been exposed to someone who was positive and are awaiting a test. These were set up uh, essentially to just house folks at a motel or a hotel setting and they're there for an extended period of time. It could be potentially two weeks, um, just like how they're doing in Albuquerque or once their test results come back, they're negative and you know they have the option to leave whenever. So if they'd like to leave upon getting results, they're free to do that as well. Um, additionally, and probably our biggest endeavor, the state of California has rolled out what we call Project Room Key, or also what we identify as our tier one sites. Um, through this, the state of California, the county of Los Angeles, and the city of Los Angeles have teamed up to identify, uh, again, just to reiterate, this is across the state, but obviously specifically in my area, um, but they have teamed up to identify motel and hotels throughout the city and the county. Um, to house our unsheltered uh, population that also would be highest at risk. So Project Room Key is intended to prioritize our unsheltered neighbors who are more, who are our most medically vulnerable. They either identify as 65 and older, have a chronic respiratory condition, or one of the other underlying health conditions that was given out per CDC guidance. These sites, again, are also staffed around the clock by RNs. Um, service, provide, service provision staff for, uh, for their 24 seven and also supplemental staff. So we have some of the city of Los Angeles staff that has been repositioned as well as, well as a few other agencies providing support during this time. Um, in Los Angeles specifically, Project Room Key has provided housing for more than 1,500 of LA's most vulnerable at the so far 22 contracted sites. Um, also providing an economic bonus just to add uh, by bringing back some of that hotel and motel staff that previously had been, you know, potentially laid off or whatever the case might be. Next slide. Um, so uh, Project Room Key, and just to highlight specifically one of our probably biggest endeavors, um, which is with one of our encampments. Um, so we have uh, been able to successfully move over 400 participants into Project Room Key just within LA Family Housing's operation. Um, we made a focus to conduct this with group encampments. However, we are we were taking referrals um, on a per individual basis. There, through HMIS Clarity, um, folks can submit a referral, and on the back end, uh, LASA, our our policy agency, essentially um, helps us decide and determine who the priority would be for for these sites. Um, but at LA Family Housing, we made an effort to focus on two of our largest and most historic encampments. Um, to talk about one of them specifically, and it's one that I, I, this story I hold pretty near and dear to my heart. Um, we had one encampment specifically, which we call our Paxton and Bradley encampment. Um, this encampment consisted of, of over 40 residents who either were 65 plus for the majority or were medically vulnerable. In addition to that, there were also people of color, specifically African American. Um, the reason this holds such a special place in my heart is I. Myself, I've born and raised in this community. I've been thankful enough to continue to work in the San Fernando Valley. Um, all of the folks in this encampment, similarly, again, you know, this is essentially a wealth of knowledge. They're all 65 and older, and this is their community. This is all they've known, um, and this is a community that they've, that they've cherished their entire life. Um, and unfortunately, these folks, these are folks that were displaced, but, you know, continue to reside within that community by, by setting up camp under a bridge. Um, we were able to, again, move these 40 plus neighbors um, into our Project Room Key site. And a lot of that was done through, you know, just our ongoing efforts to connect with them. Um, you know, and probably one of the biggest feats, which is, which is really what was instrumental in this, is the ability that we were able to prioritize majority of the folks at this encampment site to Project Room Key. So we went from creating this, uh, from having this encampment setting, this, you know, huge uh, 40 plus uh, encampment setting under a bridge to essentially moving this community into non-congregate shelter sites into one of our larger motel settings um, and that was able to create an atmosphere and and just to kind of I know I didn't mention some of the terms of the project um, but Project Room Key at the moment is slated to be a three-month program you know they have the understanding that this is going to be three months and the intent is that we're going to find permanent housing and positive 
outcomes for these folks. Um, but simply the fact, again, that we're able to move majority of the folks in this encampment into the setting was just a huge endeavor and it instilled even more trust um, with them. So as we talk about moving folks, moving unsheltered folks into non-congregate shelter settings, I could definitely highlight and speak on the fact that, you know, this proved to be instrumental um, and at the sites, it, it creates nothing but trust. Next slide. Uh, so this is just a quick map uh, one of my colleagues created and it highlights some of the resources that we have at the in, in our service provision area. Um, so on the top left, you see we have the Airtel Hotel, which consists of 260 rooms. Um, there's another tower at that hotel that just went live. This is the hotel where majority of our large encampment efforts were focused to. Um, so again, as mentioned, we have the Paxton and Bradley encampment, which if you look, there's uh, there's a purple square that says Pacoima with the with a green diamond. Um, that's the area where where the where the 40 person plus encampment um, was located, um, and we were able to move all the folks into the Airtel Plaza. Um, but just to kind of mention some of the other stuff, so we have our already existing winter shelters currently up. Um, we also have some of the Project Room Key sites that are up, and then we have the uh, the Parks and Rec sites that we're able to turn into emergency shelters as a part of our resources. And this again is just in the San Fernando Valley. It's in the spa two area. Um, Los Angeles city and county are obviously much larger as well. Next. Um, so as mentioned, the goal is to exit into permanent housing and to have obviously positive outcomes. Um, like I said, we've, uh, this is a three month program is what it's set to last for at the moment. Um, and we've kind of created a draft on our end um, on what this would look like. Um, I partnered with one of my colleagues and she created this fantastic draft of what we're providing to, to the staff. Um, so while participants are at the Project Room Key sites, the emphasis is to start working you know, immediately and identifying, uh, creating comprehensive assessments and identifying um, attainable goals for them during this period with the understanding that this isn't gonna be a forever stay sort of situation. <coughs> Ideally, this would be something where it would be a few weeks to a couple months, um, but we understand that you know there are folks where there might be different um, different outcomes, or it might be longer outcomes that you know we have to work on. Um, so this is just a quick guide. Um, you all are free to look at to reference on that we drafted um, on what a stay in a project room key motel would look like. Um, so some of the things that we're also able to do on the back end, um, as we've identified the project room key folks to be our highest vulnerable, whether it's due to age or underlying medical conditions, and the fact that we know uh, COVID-19, unfortunately, is going to be around for a little while longer, um, we're trying to prioritize all of our efforts at the moment to these identified folks. Um, so, so just to speak on some of the things in efforts to grow permanent housing outcomes for, for these participants. Um, is our is LASA, uh, as, as mentioned earlier, has given guidance that 80% of our permanent supportive housing stock is going to be prioritized for participants in Project Room Key or that have been identified as vulnerable. So again, as mentioned through our HMIS clarity system, um, folks are able to submit referrals. And even if someone is not currently in a motel and are, is sort of in the queue, they've been identified as vulnerable for COVID-19. Um, and they'll also be prioritized for our PSH stock. Um, in addition to that, a few things we're doing internally at LA Family Housing is we have designated uh, housing location staff and also employment services staff. Um, we're prioritizing all of their efforts, all of their leads, all of their uh, job, both for job leads as well as housing leads um, to be prioritized for these folks. So we're using, you know, any arsenal we could think of, of the resources we have, whether it's a private contract um, that has been given to us or some of our public funds to you know, whether it's just providing the first month's rent to providing a short subsidy through, through rapid rehousing, um, again, or permanent supportive housing if higher level of care is identified. And lastly, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to my colleagues um, you know, who have been instrumental during this time and also to our partner agencies. I'm excited to see some of the work that's already been done and also just some of the questions and, and feedback you all might have on how things could be better or you know, how we can partner you know, together across the country to kind of fight to help our unsheltered folks.
Thank you, Marco. Um, what an awesome presentation. And, and, and I'm a bit excited to learn more about Project Roomkey. Uh, just two hours ago, the National Health Care Homeless Council featured our, uh, our members in Oakland uh, and their Project Roomkey. Um, so it's really great to see what you're doing. Um, I'm going to start my video. Um, I, I think we're going to turn to Q&A now. And Mindy, are, are you going to submit questions to all of us? Yeah. Awesome. I'm just waiting for everyone to get their video on so everyone can see your lovely faces. And welcome to Jennifer Metzler, um, also from Albuquerque Healthcare for the Homeless. Glad to see you on. She'll be joining Rachel during the Q&A. Okay. And you guys can all unmute yourselves. Okay. Okay. So thanks everybody. This has been just an amazing webinar. I, I was busily taking notes for my own purposes. Um, uh, people brought up again and again in the Q and a box, the importance of the partnership between housing homelessness uh, providers and the healthcare system. And I think we've been seeing this for a few years now, the recognition um, that Homelessness is a uh, public health crisis, even before we had this uh, infectious disease that is covering the country, um, and that housing is healthcare. So it's really great to see uh, our two sectors coming together and working on this, um, and again, making ending homelessness the priority. I did want to start with a question for you all about the theme of today's webinar. Um, the reason why we wanted to have a webinar specifically focused on serving unsheltered folks in, uh, uh, during the coronavirus pandemic is that we know that in some communities, it's been um, kind of an afterthought uh, to focus on unsheltered folks. And, and, uh, and some places are just focusing on people who are already in shelters, um, making space in shelters, and then not letting more folks come into shelters. Um, and again, that's understandable, but it leaves a lot of folks and arguably the most vulnerable folks outside. So I wanted to start, uh, Michael, you can start just kind of uh, from the Healthcare for the Homeless National perspective about why it's important to focus on this population. And then we'll, for each one of you, just kind of talk about from where you sit, local level, healthcare level, state level, um, just again, why centering this population was really important in the work that you're doing in, in response to the pandemic. So go ahead, Michael. Thanks, Mindy. I'm going to answer your question, and I also want to challenge the premise of the question, if that's okay. <laughs> um, I am, I, I, to me, you know, the folks who are sleeping outside uh, are the more, most vulnerable to violence, most vulnerable to sweeps, most vulnerable uh, to harassment, and um, and these are also the folks who are not ordinarily coming uh, into our clinics or into our uh, service centers. Uh, so it's essential that we bring our services to them. Um, but you know, the, the premise of the question sort of assumes that we are prioritizing uh, among different kinds of groups, and I know that we have to do that because resources are scarce. Um, but when we segment different populations to focus on ending homelessness for a particular population, the premise of that is not a human rights framework. Um, it, the premise should be that all humans deserve housing. So uh, that is, may not be a constructive comment because it, we are living with um, limited resources. Uh, but to me, I always uh, want to both live in the system, but also challenge it at the same time. So that's my response. Definitely appreciate that. And I think one of the one of the uh, silver linings and Kendall will go to you next because um, uh, your boss, Nichelle um, from DCHD talked about this in an email about this very webinar um, that the reality is that we have lived in such a resource scarce environment that we had to do this awful uh, uh, triaging of resources. And now we um, have many, many, many more funds than we did and hopefully some more um, coming in the next CARE Act. Um, so Kendall, can you talk about uh, how this, you kind of alluded to it, this, we have a whole lot of new resources coming in. We put unsheltered folks um, in the focus and my God, Virginia might actually achieve functional zero on unsheltered homeless. Yeah, that would be incredible. Um, so we, we, you know, when we first started framing this, it was really ensuring that every person has access to that 24-7 shelter. And as we 
kind of just went along. We uh, then kind of named the prioritization of, of focusing on individuals who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness. So, um, and it's kind of developed that way um, and just to, again, put the terms on everything, but it's, it, at the core of it, it's just ensuring everyone has access to shelter. Everyone has access to, um, I mean, four walls to make sure that they are safe from um, possible contracting of COVID-19. And then also by you know, making sure that we're not overloading our congregate shelters so that people have um, adequate space for social distancing. Um, but, but no, we've never, uh, you know, and I talked about this a little bit, but, and I want to be as, I want to be as careful as possible because I don't want to overwhelm people in our state, but um, we have never have had this type of resource or this amount of resources and um, ability to focus on so many people. But we also know that the individuals experiencing unsheltered homelessness tend to be higher barrier and it takes a little bit more concentration of resources to not only serve them in shelter, but also um, enable individuals to exit to a permanent housing destination. So we realize with this wealth of resources that that's really what we want to tackle, along with you know serving everyone, but um, especially serving our most vulnerable. Okay, and for um, for our folks from Albuquerque, healthcare for the homeless. I mean, you know, healthcare for the homeless clinics um, usually do serve a largely unsheltered population. So talk about. Um, but we've also heard that some healthcare for the homeless homeless clinics had to kind of just shut down operations during the coronavirus. So for you guys, that ramping up your focus on street outreach and street medicine, what was the impetus for that? Yeah, I think for us, it was really looking at early on, we saw a decline in people seeking care and services on campus. And we really wanted to be focusing on finding people who might be delaying care. We didn't want to wait for people to get sicker during this COVID um, crisis. And we wanted to really meet, continue to meet people where they are, both literally and figuratively, and, and bring our care out to the streets. And because we've always done um, street medicine and outreach, it was an easy pivot to make. It was just kind of shifting our resources and looking at, well, if we're gonna see less folks on campus, let's let's redeploy our resources in effective ways to get the services out to people um, living in encampments and living on the street, um, and also in our isolation shelters and, and hotel spaces as well. So it was um, a pretty quick pivot for us um, to redeploy staff in, in ways um, that I, I was just amazed to see how quickly it, it happened. We also made a pretty conscious and well-informed decision to close down our resource center and our art street program, our community art program, which are two larger settings where we had a lot of folks coming in and out. And even though we you know, tried to do the social distancing in the beginning, we started to quickly realize in terms of resource distribution, it would be better use of our staffing resources, of our facilities resources um, to close those two programs and then continue to provide those services, but just out um, either on, in our campus, um, in the courtyard or out on the streets or in these new settings. So even our art program has been able to take art street and um, kind of art making supplies to those isolation hotels where people are having a hard time, you know, understandably isolating in place for 14 days at a time and, and dealing with the stress of that. Um, and then our resource center staff, instead of being in that resource center, they're out on outreach and doing enrollments for Medicaid, making sure people aren't losing access to their food stamps and Medicaid benefits and um, making sure people are connected to these different pathways into care. Thanks, Rachel. Jennifer, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I think Rachel always speaks to it really well because she's been sort of our, she's been our documentarian while she's been in action as a strategist this whole time. But I do think that, and I'm seeing some of the questions in the chat, which is maybe not my job, but um, keeping an eye to that, that as a federally qualified health center and as a 330H grantee serving exclusively the homeless population, I think that there were health centers that, um, we're trying to measure what this meant for their scope. Uh, for people who are health centers, there's sort of like what's federally approved for you to do, the locations you can do it, the, the places you can do it, the kinds of providers you can use. And we already had all of that in scope because it's what we do. So our teams have started saying, you know, we're built for this. 
at, at the risk of almost sounding trite at some point, but this is just what we do. This was also, uh, we keep telling our board that this was very much in our strategic plan to increasingly um, move into our niche of being more out in the field delivering care because that's what we can do and then collaborating with others. And so this has accelerated our strategic plan by like a three year plan by about, I don't know, what is it, eight or nine weeks? Um, but it just felt like we were we were really ready and it was the right thing to do. And we also had those relationships across the community so that they understood what role we could fill and they were ready to just welcome us into it. Great, thank you. And Marco, um, how about for you guys, this, uh, this focusing on folks who are unsheltered to get them into Project Roomkey particularly, and especially thinking about folks in encampments. I, I really love the story um, about the encampment that you focused on. Um, and, and I know there are many, many more of those kinds of stories in LA. Yeah, so, um, sorry, I, the, the mic threw me off. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think a really good example is uh, just today as I, as I was coming to my office, um, part of the reason why we want to emphasize so much efforts on our unsheltered population is um, as I was coming to my office, our headquarters is uh, conjoined to one of our shelter sites. Um, the director for that shelter site decide, was able to uh, partner with county health officials to provide on-site testing. And so these are great resources that we're able to do. And we have a population of our already 250 existing folks here um, that we can do this to very easily. However, for our unsheltered folks, you know, it's, it's not that simple. And uh, a lot of the times, while we're able to do this, you know, we have to make sure that those folks who potentially are more, more vulnerable, because as we know, um, folks without shelter are, you know, typically have trimorbid um, conditions and, and, and it, you know, it can typically get uh, worse for them living without some sort of shelter. Um, we want to just emphasize and partner to really have those services there for them. Um, I think uh, I think just in general too, as we're you know the that story for the Paxton and Bradley encampment, um, as we're trying to do these things, it's important to know that although these folks, although there are uh, the communities that have been unsheltered, they've created a community amongst themselves, and it's important to treat it as such. You know, imagine if you yourself are at your in your block and then out of nowhere I say, hey, I'm going to move you specifically um, and your family or your friends or your neighbors are going to stay here. Um, so it's important that as we're working to identify uh, moving folks into Project Room Key sites, if we have the ability, availability to prioritize really focusing on that group in Kenton setting. Um, and, and we see that there's positive outcomes. Uh, we have we have a lot of these folks are are pushing to look into shared housing options because they, you know, LA unfortunately is very expensive and they don't think that they're going to be able to do a one bedroom by themselves. So they look at rooms for rent or they look at uh, one bedrooms to move into together. Um, and additionally, as they're moving into the project room key sites, if they identify that beforehand, um, we're also having them, you know, if they if they choose to, they're moving into the hotel room together, you know, so it'll be a two bedroom hotel room that we were able to place them in or whatever the case might be. Great, thank you. Um, and this one will be also for all of you um, because you're each kind of sitting in a different perspective um, on this issue. We've had several questions about um, partnering with or are um, working through conflicts with local law enforcement. Um, and uh, Michael, again, we'll let you get us started because you, um, you can talk about kind of just kind of the bigger issues on um, uh, what CDC has recommended about not sweeping encampments. We know that it's still happening at some local levels. And then, um, and then when we talk about uh, local level folks, Albuquerque and, um, and Marco, LA Family Housing, um, given that there is always this intense interaction um, with law enforcement and folks who are unsheltered, talk about kind of navigating that in the work that you've been doing. Um, go ahead, Michael, kick us off on that one. Well, just a, a few comments. Uh, it is a strange coincidence that it's uh, our members in Albuquerque that are on the phone for this question because they're the folks that I usually turn to for uh, an ex exemplars of police <laughs> relationships. Um, so I'm excited to hear from them. Sorry to put you on the spot. Um, but, you know, uh, I, I would really just recommend uh, the resources of the Housing Not Handcuffs campaign and the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty, uh, who are really the leaders on uh, criminalization work, and, um, and we've done some work with them previously, There's some resources on our website about uh, forming sort of strategic alliances with police 
Um, but this comes back to trauma-informed care uh, and a trauma-informed perspective ultimately to me. And uh, I know that as we are scrambling new partnerships, a lot of times bringing in new folks into the field uh, to serve our folks, um, we're having to figure out how to train folks quickly um, on some of our core values that they may not have already um, you know, undergone training on. Um, and I think that's part of what we're trying to do, Mindy, with the online courses that we're collaborating on too, um, to provide those resources for right. Um, and I just wanted to mention too that I know that a lot of folks, uh, a lot of communities, uh, the National Guard has been deployed. Um, I know that in some cases they are meant just to help with distributing food and other, um, you know, supplies and not meant to be security, but in other communities they are intimidating clients. Um, and so we need to be conscious of that as well. Great, thank you. Um, since you brought up the work that Albuquerque Healthcare for the Homeless does, um, do you guys want to chime in on working with uh, local law enforcement? Sure. We have a long history in Albuquerque working with our Albuquerque Police Department. Um, on one side, we're part of a police reform effort, a community coalition um, following the Department of Justice consent decree on excessive use of force here. And on the other hand, we work really closely with our police department when we're um, on our campus and we, we have issues with illegal activity. So we really respect our relationship and work closely with them. Um, and then I think we do a lot of work to be really clear in our, our different roles of that they're enforcement and we're public health. And sometimes we're not gonna see eye to eye on certain recommendations, but we can leverage our partnerships in really effective ways so that um, our police department knows us as a great resource in the community. They can turn to us to say, hey, we're, we're seeing people out on the street we have concerns about, especially during the pandemic. Do you have information we can hand out? So we're passing them along our, our patient information, um, patient education, outreach education information as well, and making sure that you know, they're connected into um, the system of care that we have worked so hard to develop with our, our city of Albuquerque and our great collaborative partners. Um, and I think it's always going to be, you know, our role will always be that public health. We're here to help provide services and care, and their role will be more of the public safety, but we can find ways to collaborate and still work together effectively. And we, we've been able to kind of walk that, that line very well here in Albuquerque in a lot of ways. And um, of course, they're always still learning from, from others around the country and, and how that looks. Um, I, I think what's been really important for us as we do step into the, the street medicine response for COVID has been to kind of ensure um, and assure our community partners, including the city and the police department, that we are providing care to people in encampments and that we are there as a resource for people to help them safely isolate. And sometimes that is a better um, solution for people and they're making a really good choice for themselves to stay in an encampment instead of going into a congregate setting in a lot of situations and um, that's been the way that we've been able to kind of navigate this question about enforcement especially during a public health crisis like COVID. Um, a lot of people are, are worried that if we, we give them a test out on street outreach that they're going to have to go into an isolation hotel or a shelter for 14 days and because of substance use or pets or whatever issue, um, very good reasons that is not an option for people. Um, and we wanna be able to be there as support and to reassure our partners that we can provide those services and help people safely isolate. You know, Jenny, you would add anything? I would just um, say, I think what Rachel was saying is it's become, we've had sort of three different frameworks for conversations to keep everyone engaged. And one is that this absolutely is not on the backs of community-based nonprofit organizations just doing their best together. But this really has to be a public health emergency systems response. And so that's, you know, the tucking in that Rachel's talking about. That's always been our framework. And we've always felt healthcare for the homeless is as much a public health model as it is a services model. Um, necessarily because of the circumstances of homelessness. We've also, um, and that goes along with our philosophy of care, we've also been able to frame things really well to stay engaged, you know, to think through how we work together by thinking, and we've learned this from our peers in healthcare for the homeless across the country who have experienced all kinds of hazards and disasters um, 
natural and otherwise, and that there's the, the pre-event planning and preparation, there's the actual event, whatever that is, and then there's the post-event, and that's where um, you know, the racial justice and the equity kinds of questions are super important because who's gonna get left behind long-term? So we've always got an eye to that. And then I think the other thing that's been really useful even as recently as the meeting we had before we came on this call, is an enforcement framework because that's as much working with law enforcement and all these other entities that are being brought in that may or may not understand our philosophy of care, what we embrace and what others do, but catching up quickly on the training as Michael was saying, but also understanding everyone has a role and enforcement is enforcement, it has a place at times, including in a public health emergency. So, uh, you know, our, our governor and uh, the attorneys at the Department of Health here in New Mexico have were very open with us and talked about being prepared to take to the courts public health isolation holds as needed during this pandemic. And so we've been able to talk with public health officials, other services providers, and say enforcement and running to security when there are behavioral uh, tensions or behaviors that are unfamiliar about people who just don't want to stay in place. That, that there are people's rights, but there are also a whole host of alternatives in our toolkit for supporting people and staying in place and keeping themselves and others safe from a health perspective. And then enforcement is just one thing in the toolkit. So we've had a great opportunity. That frame, those three frameworks have really helped us to, uh, to, te to stay engaged in those conversations because we all have to stay engaged in this work right now. Thank you, that's great. Marco, how about for you guys? Um, long history of uh, interaction of homeless folks and law enforcement in LA. And uh, so how's the good stuff that's happening in encampments now working with law enforcement? Yeah, so thankfully, um, I mean, there's definitely a long history there. Uh, but thankfully, a few years ago, the city of LA, the, the LAPD um, enacted what they call their HOPE team. Um, that's essentially a, a homeless outreach team or division through LAPD. Um, so they've been completely instrumental during this time because we've been partnering with them a lot when we do just our regular, when we were doing our regular non-COVID outreach efforts um, and their efforts were to provide uh, information in a very trauma-informed manner to folks experiencing homelessness, um, if there was going to be a cleanup or anything of the sort of the such, um, and it had been there for a quite a while, they would typically inform them, you know, and, and instead of just completely going to cite them or saying, hey, you have to move right now, um, they would talk to them about how, you know, it's not appropriate for them to potentially be at that sidewalk, whatever the case. Um, so, I mean, it's not, you know, there, unfortunately, it's not a, uh, shoot, I'm just blanking on the term, um, you know, at, at least the way they went about it was informing folks again in a trauma-informed way, like, hey, you know, we're going to come by. If you're here again in a week, we'll have to um, post up a sign and we'll be conducting a cleanup. Um, through COVID-19, though, the city of LA has given guidance that they're not to uh, sweep, clean up, move, or essentially cite um, folks that are experiencing homelessness along the streets. Um, and so as a result, uh, that's been completely helpful because uh, you know the, their approach is different. They are, they are doing that law enforcement piece when it comes to behavioral aspects and stuff like that, but not anything in the manner of, hey, your encampment is here, I'm gonna cite you if you don't move kind of thing. Um, additionally, when we've been able to tag team our efforts, um, as, as I mentioned, we were taking law enforcement with us, whether it was LAPD or the county sheriff's department, um, and teaming up to, to our different encampments that we would go to. And some of the positives from that is that since we already had that longstanding relationship with them, um, once COVID hit, you know, it was kind of, okay, we know what we're doing. Let's tackle this just like we have been. Um, and let's prioritize, you know, who's going where and where the outreach efforts are. Um, to kind of reference the Paxton and Bradley encampment again, you know, this was again a, a very large encampment. It had at least, uh, it had over 40 folks uh, in the encampment setting. Um, and as you can imagine, there was a lot of items uh, that folks either left there or whatever the case might be. Um, with our efforts to move majority of those folks into our project room key, room key site, we also notified them, hey, you know what? Uh, we know you've been here for a few years already. Just want to let you know that as we transition you over to uh, Project Room Key, you're going to be able to pack two 60 gallon or two 30 gallon bags of items, um, and you know take the most important stuff with you. The stuff that you leave behind, if you can identify a safe space to keep it, um, we're hoping to do a cleanup after. So you know we went about it in a manner where we 
you know, safely move this community into a more appropriate setting and also inform them, hey, we're going to be partnering with city and sanitation, uh, uh, law enforcement and sanitation folks once we clear out the encampment and provide you guys with shelter um, to kind of clean up. So that was, I think, probably our best approach during this pandemic on how we tackled, you know, our traditional, hey, there's an encampment setting, we need to go in and clean it up um, sort of efforts. Great, thank you. Um, Kendall, I have a question for you. I know that you answered it in, in some of the, the typed questions, but just uh, for folks who didn't get a chance to read those, can you describe again the different funding streams that you guys are using at the state level? And then maybe go into a little bit of detail um, because I suspect a lot of folks on the call are more local level folks, um, like how that ends up playing out at the CMC and program level. Okay, absolutely. So um, just over, I think it was $10 million in CARES Act ESG funding that was allocated to the state of Virginia. And um, we also received approval for FEMA funding for Virginia. So the first initial wave was the CARES Act ESG and FEMA. And we received, um, kind of acted like an advance from the state of Virginia. So um, once CARES Act ESG funding comes in, uh, we'll have that money to come back, but instead of Virginia kind of gave us an advance, so we didn't have to wait on that. We could immediately get this funding out to start meeting um, the urgent needs of, of our communities. And then it's deployed through, so we have 27 continua of care and balance of state local planning groups. So um, balance of state COC and it's divided into I think 13 local planning groups. And so each have their own crisis response system that's localized to meet their community's needs. But it incorporates, you know, you know, it goes from coordinated entry, outreach, shelter, everything like that. And so our priority was um, on making sure that everyone had access to shelter and, and prioritizing individuals who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness and to, to getting them into shelter. And so if a community had other funding sources that were dedicated to meeting that need, they could then employ this in other ways with their emergency sheltering response for COVID. But um, otherwise, all communities were, were uh, continuing with our priority focus and then um, applying their other funding th through the either um, maybe HUD direct other state or local funds. Does that answer your question, Mindy? Yes, thank you. Um, and I want to give again, um, we've had some questions. And so for for each of you that have uh, kind, kind of offer your perspective on this. Um, Kendall, it'll be a little bit different for you because you're in a state agency. So you're probably the one that people will be advocating to, to do things for but um, but especially for Marco, Rachel and Jennifer. Um, that what does the advocacy look like at the local level to make sure um, that uh, that you know our elected officials at the local level are juggling a lot of different things on a public health crisis. So, so tell me about some of the advocacy work that your organizations have been doing to make sure that homelessness is kind of lifted up as a as an important piece of uh, the public health response that elected officials are are working on at the local level. Marco, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, so I mean, I, I definitely want to say that you know, being in Los Angeles, Los Angeles, we're definitely spoiled. Um, in the sense that our mayor, our county, and even our governor identified um, our unsheltered population as a priority during this pandemic. Um, so again, we've been able to prioritize a lot of efforts like extending our uh, the winter shelter program, um, creating uh, emergency shelters through our city's parks and rec centers, um, and then also the project room key sites. So advocacy was definitely there, but it was a really quick nudge and you know they were off in the right direction. Um, there are a few things that we're trying to prioritize on the back end that are very, you know, straightforward level sort of items. So a good example is now that we've identified uh, just in LA, through LA Family Housing 400 plus participants um, for our project room key sites and we're going to be prioritizing the permanent supportive housing that's available for them. Um, one of the barriers that we're seeing is that some of them obviously, you know, don't have IDs and unfortunately our state DMV is not open to the public. so there's um that's that's one of the kind of low not necessarily low level it's a it's a really big you know someone could be 
uh, match to a permanent supportive housing unit and then the only thing missing is our ID. Um, so we've been advocating through uh, our county agency, which is LASA, as well as through um, just contacts we have at the at sort of like the, at sort of the governor's office to help push this along and see if we can create um, uh, efforts to have DMV folks attend project or go to the project room key sites to process their IDs and process the ID vouchers we have for them and stuff like that. Um, so it's a lot of, you know, we are we are working directly and at, for, depending on the issue, we're going to different levels of government. Um, the only issue right now I, I want to say is we're going straight to the governor's office and, and we're advocating that they open up um, and allow us to to have the DMV on site at these at these locations. Thanks. That's a that's something I hadn't heard about yet, but it makes total sense and um, really cool to hear about y'all advocating for that. And for Albuquerque folks, how about y'all? I think we also had a, a pretty um, easier time in Albuquerque. Our, our city government um, prioritized homelessness as an issue before the COVID um, pandemic. And so it was kind of on the top of their mind, um, but we were able to take that and our leadership role in, in some of the conversations around addressing homelessness in Albuquerque and provide our policy and practice recommendations from pretty much day one, we put together a, um, a list of policy recommendations and largely pulling from our partners across the country. And I, I think what's been really effective for us locally has been able to show best practices from our partners, um, particularly on the West Coast that experienced the crisis a little bit sooner than us or maybe a couple of weeks ahead of us. And we had the opportunity because it was hitting here a little bit later to be ahead of things and be able to um, learn from some of our partners and make those recommendations that they were making to their city governments about emergency funding for things like PPE, hand washing stations, um, you know, we're pushing right now for if one rapid testing becomes available, that that's prioritized for the population of people experiencing homelessness as they are high risk and vulnerable. And because they're such a mobile population, we want to make sure that we're able to address their needs quickly and effectively with rapid testing. Um, you know, we were able to really work closely with our, our great advocacy partners that we already had um, here in Albuquerque uh, and at the state level, our, our legal advocate partners on things like the eviction moratorium and um, ending utility shutoffs and those sorts of things. Um, so that we really leveraged our partnerships with our legal advocacy groups. And then, you know, what we've been doing all along is just funneling great information, I think, to our policymakers um, and those that we're working with on the response about the effectiveness of, you know, what kind of funding is coming through, how are other cities using it, how can we leverage that into housing resources really quickly and effectively. And uh, I think we've had a lot of good, good success. Um, we're starting to hear things in conversations now where people are saying, well, you know what, instead of just moving people into these community centers, maybe we should move vulnerable people into housing. And how can we look at prioritizing housing resources? And, you know, going back to the beginning of this conversation, where we all know so well that housing is healthcare. Um, I think our partners have known this all along, but the conversations and the amount of work that has gone into setting up other shelter spaces and isolation spaces um, and moving people out of congregate settings, I think is just really bringing to the forefront the need to invest in permanent housing and making sure that, you know, if we get people into housing right now, we're not gonna have to um, have as much of a workload on our hands when we have maybe a, a phase two of this, you know, another surge in the fall or another pandemic down the road. If we can prioritize those housing resources, um, we can really be more effective. And we're starting to see people saying that and that it's been really exciting. Great, thank you. Um, unfortunately, we are a little bit over time and I do have one more slide. First, I want to thank you all so much, all our wonderful panelists that were on the webinar today and thank you for the incredible work that you're doing today. Thanks to folks who um, attended the webinar. Um, I know what a struggle you all are having in your local communities and you are the heroes on the front lines and we just really honor that work that you're doing and want to be able to be a resource for you all. So uh, in light of the conversation that we've been having about the importance of housing and how um, different things can look when we have enough resources,
Um, you can take really quick action now um, to contact your senators and representatives um, to let them know to prioritize housing and homelessness funding in the second CARES Act. Um, we've seen for state of Virginia that there's the real possibility when we have enough funding for housing for everyone um, that we can actually end unsheltered homelessness. So just a really quick action that you can take there um, to make a change at the national level and to get funding to your local communities. Thanks everyone for being a part of the webinar today and we'll look for you on the next webinar. Goodbye everybody.